about, say, one to five days. So I'm hoping that some of the methods and techniques we use on the weather side could potentially be applied um, in the evaluation of severe weather in convection permitting climate simulations. And here's the obligatory tornado photo that I actually did take. This is not from Boulder. This is from uh, Western Texas about 10 years ago. So I'm going to start with just an animation of uh, a forecast. This is from uh, the FE3 model that this is NOAA's new uh, global model configuration. So this is a, a two and a half day forecast of um, reflectivity across the contiguous US. So I kind of just want to point out a few things here. One being um, the different types and modes of convection that are present on a given day across the contiguous US. In the central um, part of the US here, you can see more organized say MCS structures here early on in the forecast, and those evolve and slide to the southeast. There's several of those that, that occur during the, the length of this forecast. And then behind that, there's some more disorganized cellular convection associated with this low pressure system. There's a coastal low that moves up the coast there that's associated with elevated reflectivity values. And then there's the uh, North American monsoon. Let me move this one more time across the West that is diurnally driven over the first um, couple days of this forecast. And so a challenge um, on the from the weather perspective is to identify which of these storms will potentially produce um, severe weather hazards. And so we'd like to devise some objective method to identify severe convection in the models across a variety of seasons, regions, different environments, and different environments generally lead to different convective modes. And so here I'm defining severe convection as this set of criteria that is actually forecast um, by NOAA on a daily basis. Um, the occurrence of convective wind gusts greater than 50 knots, hail greater than one inch in diameter, or the presence of a, of a tornado. So when we look at the diagnostic fields from convection permitting models, we generally have a handful that are related to convection, uh, reflectivity, for example, or precipitation. So if you want to make a forecast of heavy precipitation, it's pretty straightforward. You can take the, the model output field of accumulated precipitation above some threshold, and that can be your forecast for heavy precip. And you can verify it against observed precipitation. So for severe convection, we don't have uh, fields that are specifically related to the individual hazards. So we're not resolving tornadoes. We're not resolving uh, explicitly hailstones. Um, we're starting to resolve convective wind gusts at grid spacings of three to four kilometers. So we have these other diagnostic fields that we've developed to extract information on the potential for severe weather, one being um, updraft helicity. Uh, for the hail field, traditionally what's used are vertically integrated grapple, or sometimes there's um, hail models within, within the convection permitting simulations. And then for tornadoes, which I'll talk about briefly towards the end, what might be useful is some metric of low-level vorticity. And so when we have forecasts based on those fields, we can observe, we can compare them to observed fields of severe reports that are provided by um, NOAA. So I'll generally refer to these fields as surrogates for the presence of severe weather hazards. And so one of the most popular surrogate fields is updraft helicity. And this is used primarily because it is skillful at identifying the presence of supercells. And so supercells uh, produce a disproportionate share of severe reports of all different uh, types, hail, tornadoes, and damaging winds. So if you can identify where the supercells are in, this, in the forecast simulations, you generally can produce a pretty decent forecast of the severe weather hazards. And so updraft helicity is just this integrated metric of updraft speed and vertical vorticity over some layer, usually in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. And so the swaths here are the fields of updraft helicity um, integrated over a one-hour period. So for a lot of these diagnostics to capture the, the storm scale variability that occurs um, from time, pep, time step to time step within the model. What's done is the maximum value is saved over the course of an hour 
And then we use that to make predictions of, in this case, supercells. So this, this diagnostic has been actually used by a handful of studies over the last decade in dynamical downscaling experiments. So on the left here, one of the first studies was from Jeff Trapp's group. And they looked at updraft helicity, reflectivity combinations um, over a retrospective period, downscaled reanalyses. So this is um, the frequency of <coughs> some threshold of updraft helicity occurring during two months, and then compared that to <coughs> severe weather observations. And then there's actually a presentation at the this last, the first iteration of this workshop, and. Uh, this is from a paper that came out of some of that work. A similar type of approach. Now, they were just looking at updraft speed the, um, exceeding a certain threshold and looking at changes in past versus future, um, future climate. And so I'm going to try to um, provide some context in terms of what we've done on the weather side to maybe advance some of these studies towards identifying, say, specific hazards or differences in um, convective <coughs> mode going forward. So that's really what's driving the um, dynamically the uh, occurrence of the severe weather hazards that we're interested in. So from a climatological perspective, we have different set data sets to look at of previous convection permitting model simulations. One of them that I've used pretty extensively is run at National Severe Storms Laboratory, and it's been run for basically the past decade. Um, so this is used in real time by forecasters, and the configuration has stayed essentially constant through this 10-year period. So I'm using this eight-year subset to look at some of the climatological variations of some of these surrogate fields and seeing how they relate to um, the observed occurrence of severe weather reports. So these are 36-hour forecasts at four-kilometer horizontal grid spacing. And so we start out by selecting, say, our diagnostic, which will use updraft helicity. And we want to see over a 24-hour period, we can compare the number of grid boxes where an updraft helicity threshold is exceeded which, with the number of observed severe weather reports in those grid boxes. And we can look at that over a large collection of forecasts to come up with some idea of um, typical magnitudes that could be used to identify severe convection. And so on the right here, there's uh, basically images of the bias here. So if you have shading in gray, then there's more observed reports than the threshold we're using for the uh, surrogate severe reports. That's what I mean by SSRs here. So those are our reports that are basically just where UH exceeds a certain threshold, and then we compare that to the observed severe reports. And so in red, the number of model reports, so the models producing, you can, you can think of this as the models producing more observed severe weather events than what is observed, and vice versa in gray for two different periods. So this is highlighting sort of this different, the different biases that are present regionally and seasonally within our domain, whereas in the eastern part of the US during the summer, there's a lot more observed severe reports than this particular updraft helicity threshold we used. And then in the cool season, the biases change, where you have a more of a north-south distribution of, of the observed versus model bias. So in a real-time forecasting framework, we take basically our information about the calibration here over some previous period and turn that into a, a forecast. So this is just one individual forecast based on some of these uh, methods that I described. We can smooth that to get from a deterministic forecast, we can smooth that a little bit to get um, what are kind of deemed quasi-probabilities just based on the spatial density of reports. We can do the same thing with the observations. So we have our forecast in the upper right here. We can compare that to the, the binary ones and zeros with something like the Breyer skill score. We can compare the the two smooth fields with a metric like the fraction skill score. So if we look at the skill for the Breyer skill score, and this is just for, for July 1st, basically a, a couple week window around um, July 1st, you can see the biases that were on that other, other slide are present when we look at the skill scores. So it's actually highlighting that this surrogate, this diagnostic we're using has different behavior in, say, the eastern U.S., where we really need to use some, a low threshold to have a maximum in skill, 
The reds are positive Briar skill score, so a skill that's greater than climatology. And the grays are negative Briar skill score. And so in the central plains, we, central part of the US, we tend to need to use a larger magnitude of this diagnostic. And so these variations in skill are really driven by the different types of convection that's responsible for severe weather. Whereas in the central plains, we tend to have more MCSs and supercells. And in the eastern US, there's not as many supercells. So you tend to get very low magnitudes of the subdraft helicity diagnostic. But because it's pretty well correlated with updraft speed, you still have a pretty decent amount of skill um, using this diagnostic to identify severe convection in the eastern US. If we look uh, seasonally, so that was just sort of regional differences. We use this to give us some indication of severe weather forecast skill. Maximum in skill tends to occur during the spring over the contiguous US with a decrease during the cool season. And there's variations based on how we use this, one of those calibration methods where the greatest skill generally comes when we're using this calibration that's done on kind of a per grid box by grid box per day where it can kind of take advantage of those seasonal and regional variations in the skill of the, the severe weather diagnostic. So cool season events are really challenging from a forecasting perspective and summertime severe weather events as well. They tend to be less skillful in terms of um, anticipating severe convection. And so that potentially could be one of two reasons. One is that there's just lower practical predictability for those types of events. Um, so it's difficult to pinpoint where a severe storm will be on a given day. Or it could be the diagnostic we're using isn't directly tied to the dynamics that are driving <coughs> um, the severe weather hazards. And so to get some idea of this, we want to look at potentially human forecasts for these events to give us some insight. So on the left, I have a human forecast issued by NOAA for a particular day. And on the right, there's an individual forecast from our um, this deterministic convection allowing model that we're looking at. And so if we just look at another metric here, this equitable threat score, which is just showing higher values are better here, um, seasonal variations in the green, which is basically the model forecast and then the blue, which is the human forecasts, we see for a good chunk of the year from April through September, these lines aren't too far apart. And so we're, you can think of that as basically the, the model forecasts are constrained by the practical predictability. Um, the, the human forecasts aren't able to really improve upon the model just because the model does a good job at anticipating where severe weather is, at least during this time frame. It does a pretty poor job here, but the human forecasts aren't much better. So there's just limits on how accurate we can um, anticipate convective storms because of limits to practical predictability in this regime. Where there's the largest gap is actually during the cool season, November through February, where there's a big difference here. And so this suggests that the diagnostics we're using, where there's some limitation in the model um, the model forecast, maybe it's resolute, maybe it's more model horizontal grid spacing for some of these events in terms of the cool season severe weather processes that are driving the hazards. Um, but it seems like there's, there's the chance to improve upon um, these forecasts in the cool season quite a bit. And so to, to look at some of the differences in especially cool season skill and skill for different types of severe hazards at higher resolution. We uh, conducted this experiment where we looked at 500 different severe weather events over a seven year period and ran simulations, full CONUS simulations. Um, here's the, the grid here initialized with GFS um, at three kilometer horizontal grid spacing and one kilometer horizontal grid spacing. And so the goal here is to look at a handful of things. And we've just started the analysis of this data set here. But we're trying to tease out um, some of the differences in skill and cool season, as well as what <coughs> is the added value of the one kilometer grid spacing, at least for one to three day uh, weather forecasts. So I just want to show a couple images here to motivate this. Um, this is an example of a uh, what's deemed a QLCS or quasi-linear convective system, sort of related to um, an MCS. And this is a cool season severe weather event across the southeastern US. And if we look at, say, the low level uh, surface wind field, 
So this is an integrated quantity here. So this is at the start of the forecast. And then this is a, uh, a maximum wind over, I think, an 18-hour period. So you can imagine this squall line here moving across the domain left to right. And this is the maximum surface winds associated with that. This is in the forecast with the three kilometer grid spacing. And this is the one kilometer grid spacing forecast. So there's certain aspects of the forecast associated with this convective event that are not present at all at three kilometers. Primarily these, these left, uh, these west to east oriented swaths of elevated surface winds. So if I toggle back and forth here, um, at three kilometers, the, those swaths aren't present at all. At one kilometers, you can, you can start to depict those, and those are likely due to potential uh, vortices that are developing on the edge of QLCSs. Um, QLCS events are notoriously difficult for forecasters to anticipate because there's um, severe weather associated with them is often uh, often associated with low-level vortices that are very small in terms of their um, horizontal extent, one to two kilometers, um, and very shallow near the surface. And so we would expect to see some, hopefully some benefit at one kilometer grid spacing at beginning to resolve these processes, and then hopefully make better guidance based on some of these, have better guidance available based on some of these high resolution forecasts. And I'll just briefly mention here, um, we've also looked at MCS properties in the one kilometer forecasts. We tend to see cold pools that are slightly stronger in the one kilometer simulations, and that translates over, say, a six to 12 hour period um, with, dis with displacements in the three and one kilometer forecasts. This is just an example here. This is showing the, the cold pool virtual potential temperature deficit, indicating that the, the one kilometer cold pools in our simulations are slightly colder which ends up with a, with a faster propagation speed to the south and east. OK, just to summarize um, some of these thoughts. Uh, so the usage of updraft helicity um, as this uh, surrogate severe diagnostic really does depend on convective mode and environment. It was originally designed to detect supercells. It has utility for different convective modes as well, say MCSs. And then there's potentially times, maybe in the cool season, where it really does fail to um, capture regions where there will be severe weather events. And other diagnostics may be helpful there, especially for other specific hazards, such as tornadoes. We've been looking at low-level rotation diagnostics. Going to one kilometer grid spacing on the weather side, we do kind of subjectively see value in the forecast. They, they qualitatively look different than um, at three kilometers. And so there's, there's really kind of a debate within the weather community about, especially when we're trying to predict things like tornadoes, on um, um, how much grid spacing we need and which is, and is realistic um, in terms of the trade-off of wanting to run ensembles for these events as well. And hopefully uh, there's some knowledge that we're gaining on the weather side into the usage of these uh, severe weather diagnostics, which we can hopefully share with the uh, convection permitting climate modeling community. So with that, I will uh, take any questions.